Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. Wish you a very happy new year and I hope you all are safe and healthy. I would like to also give a shout out to all our speakers from the conference and webinar and the trainers in the year 2021 for sharing their knowledge and learning experience with all of us with the hardware.io community. Friends, if you also would like to start meeting people in person and hardware, specifically hardware security researchers, we have announced our Hardware USA conference in June in Santa Clara. Our CFP has just opened. So if you would like to send in your research paper, we would be more than happy to uh, view it, score them, and let you know if your talk has been selected for the conference. Today, I'm glad to uh, invite Michael, who needs no introduction to the hardware security community. He has been part of the popular and the most famous microarchitectural site channel attacks like Meltdown, Spectre, Fallout, and so on. He's currently a faculty at CISPA, Helmholtz Center for Information Security in Germany. Today, Michael will share with us his results and research on automated discovery of microarchitectural attack vectors using CPU fuzzing. He will also discuss the de and de uh, discuss the development and case studies of OSIS and Trister framework. A little bit of uh, house rules for today's webinar. The presentation will be for 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for Q&A. If any of you have any questions, please send them across via the Zoom chat. I will read the questions out after the presentation is complete. Also, the session will be recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel for later view. And friends, uh, it would be nice if you switch on your cameras as well to show us your smiley faces and let us know from where you have joined in. So without any further delay, Michael, I invite you to begin your presentation. Thanks a lot for this nice introduction here. Let me quickly share my screen. Yeah, I think that works. Perfect. All right. Yes. As already said, you already had the best introduction I, I could ask for, and I didn't ask for that. So my name is uh, Michael Schwartz. I'm a faculty currently at CISPA Helmholtz Center, and I'm working, I'm, I worked for quite some time, and I'm still working on researching CPU security and side channels in CPUs. So you can always reach me. My email address is here. I'm also on Twitter. So if you have any questions, I know I can't talk about all the things in these 30 minutes here, feel free to write me and we can have a nice discussion. So you might have seen things like uh, news things like uh, these like Intel zombie load bug fix to slow data center computers. Only new CPUs can truly fix zombie load and Spectre. So this, this headlines, that we had, or even you might have seen it on TV, where there was like a CNN back in 2018, computer chip flaws impact billions of devices, developing story. So what is this, this all about? And all these things that we have seen there are talking about microarchitectural side channels, microarchitectural attacks. These are some really powerful and quite novel attack techniques. And we have seen such microarchitectural attacks attacking cryptographic implementations, so stealing cryptographic keys without using any vulnerabilities in the crypto libraries. We have seen them use, being used to spy on user behavior, so seeing what the user is currently typing, which websites the user is opening. And we've also seen them as augmentation for traditional software exploits. So software exploits are still like the number one thing to exploit the system. But side channels, microarchitectural attacks can help a bit there. For example, if you mount an attack on the kernel, we'll also see that today as an example, you first need to find the location of the kernel because we have this kernel address space layout randomization and side channels can be super effective in finding the kernel and then helping traditional exploits. And also these side channels in particular are an important building block for transient execution attacks. And you've also seen them in these news headlines here with zombie load, spectre, meltdown. These are all transient execution attacks. They are not side channels on its own. They are microarchitectural attacks and they rely on side channels. But if I'm talking about side channels and side channel attacks, what do I even mean? So let's take a simple example. This is a well-known 
uh, equation here, that's the RSA uh, decryption. And that's mathematically sound, that's super secure in a mathematical way. But the mathematics is just an abstraction. We have to implement that in software at some point. And if you write that in software, you can already see how we get difference in execution times depending on the secret values that are used if implemented in a naive way with different execution flows depending on some secret bits. But also the software is just an abstraction layer on top of the hardware. And the hardware also does different stuff depending on the bits it uses. Like zero bits, one bits have different power consumptions. So again, an abstraction layer where things behave differently and might leak something. And then we have something in between software and hardware where we have the microarchitecture, the implementation of the CPU. And this consists of a lot of things, a lot of elements. There are, for example, well-known things like CPU caches. And they also introduce some side effects. So for example, there's a quite simple side channel attack that relies on caches that is called flush and reload. And in flush and reload, we have some CPU with a cache. We have some shared memory between two applications. that has only one copy in the cache as well. And so if it's cached, it's cached for all the applications using it. Now an attacker can use unprivileged instructions, assembly instructions, to get rid of data from the cache, remove it from the entire cache hierarchy, flush it from the cache. And then if the victim accesses the shared data, it's transparently put into the cache and copy will be stored there. That happens in the CPU, fully automated. Now an attacker can then later on access the shared memory and measure how long it takes to access it. And from that, an attacker can learn whether the thing is in the cache, because if this access is fast, then it's served from the cache. And then the attacker knows that the victim accessed this part of the shared memory. If the victim is slow, it was not in the cache. It had to be fetched from main memory, slow, and the attacker knows that the victim did not access that part of the shared memory in between. And this is actually a timing difference that we can easily see. So if you use our measurement primitives that we have on modern CPUs, we get timestamp counters from the hardware, from the CPU. And if we measure a cache hit, then this was on my laptop here, we see something like, okay, around 60 something cycles, including all the, the measurement overhead. So like fencing and then storing the values, the real cache hit is a bit faster, but we see they are all in this order of magnitude here. And if things are not in the cache, then we suffer a cache miss. Things have to be loaded from memory. My memory is quite slow here. And all these things take at least 320 cycles to get them from main memory back to the CPU. So we can clearly distinguish these two cases. And with that, see if data comes from the cache. So it was recently used, or if it has to be fetched from the main memory, and it was not used. And this is a nice, observation is already a side channel. It provides some information, but no data leakage yet. But depending on the implementation of a victim, this could lead to side channel information to actual, actual data leakage. If we go back to our example of RSA decryption, then we have this mathematical description. And yes, we have to implement that in software at some point. And a naive implementation of that, that was used a lot in the past, is called square and multiply. And in this approach, we look at the exponent, at the secret exponent d, in a bit stream representation. And then we start with a result, we set our results to c. And then we go bit by bit through the exponent. And every time we find a one bit in the exponent, we square our current result and then multiply it by c. If there's a zero bit in the exponent, we only square our result. Zero bit, only square, one bit, square and multiply, square and multiply for one bit, zero bit, just square. And from that, we can already see that it is sufficient to observe the state of the square and the multiply function. So if we mount this flush and reload attack from before, then we can see like 
is both the, re the result, so that, that the square and the multiply function in the cache where both of them accessed, then we know that the victim just processed a one bit in the exponent. If we only see the square function in the cache, then we know that was just a square, no multiply, and a zero bit in the exponent. And that actually gives us the entire private key of this RSA encryption with this vulnerable implementation. Of course, we don't want to use vulnerable implementation, so there are also secure implementations that can't be attacked with side channels. But even in that case, we can go one step further. So now we have metadata, so we only leaked information about something happening, like some memory address was accessed or was not accessed. That's what we get with a side channel. Now we want to have real data, like what is stored at this memory location. If we can achieve that, we directly get the crypto key, for example. And this is also something that we can do. And these things are called transient execution attacks. They kind of evolve from side channel attacks. They still use a side channel as one of the main building blocks. So side channels still very important. And they use that in a kind of indirection because they leak data in a state that we cannot observe an out of order execution and speculative execution. We can both group them together to transient execution. So things we never see on the architectural level, but which we then can make visible using side channel attacks. So we leak the data in this invisible domain and then transfer them to the visible domain using a side channel. And we know such attacks as meltdown, specter, zombie load, foreshadow, fallout, LVI, crosstalk, you name them, they're nowadays quite a lot of them, although the first one was only discovered in 2017, not that long ago. ago. So we have all of them, but we didn't talk about like finding them. How does that work? And this is actually a huge problem. Finding side channels and vulnerabilities that are then exploited in trans and execution attacks is a really complex and time-consuming process, requires a lot of manpower, trying a lot of stupid stuff, investing a lot of time, and also being lucky. So this is not something that scales. So the idea is we want to automate that. But how can we automate like a complex process for finding vulnerabilities? One of the ideas is to apply techniques that we know from software to the hardware. So we know if you have complex software systems, that contain some bugs that we want to find, doesn't scale if we do manual analysis. So we have techniques like fuzzing that try to automatically generate things to trigger bugs, trigger vulnerabilities that we can then later on fix. And we can apply these techniques also to the CPU. So on the CPU, we don't really have data inputs that trigger something and we don't have bugs that crash, but we can see like the input are basically code sequences that we put into the CPU. And we get timing differences for some of the code sequences. And we can consider them like vulnerabilities, like bugs for software fuzzing. Of course, fuzzes can be inc incredibly complex, and most software fuzzes are. But we can also start with super dumb fuzzing with random inputs. So we define a model of what we want to fuzz can't just randomly do something. We want to define certain things that we can then use as a model for our fuzz. So we define microarchitectural states, state zero, state one, and then instruction sequences that go to these states. So we want a reset sequence to always get our microarchitectural element, like our cache, in this known state S zero. No matter where we are, if you are already in the state or not, in a different state. And then we want to find a trigger sequence that moves to the different sequence, to S1. In any case, it doesn't matter where we currently are. And then, additionally, we want to have some measure sequence that tells us whether we are currently in S0 or S1. And then we can start testing that. And you will quickly see why this is a smart idea to do it like that. So we have this reset sequence, and then we measure we see in which state we are. And we call this the cold path because nothing happens. We reset the state, we measure, we expect to be in state zero. 
And on the other side, we also have this reset. Then we have this trigger sequence that should get us to S1. And then we measure. And then we have our hot bath because we did something in between. And we should be in state one. And if they have different timings in the measurement sequence, then we know, OK, that's an interesting interference where some instruction sequences lead to timing differences. And that might be a side channel. And it might even be exploitable. So we might be able to build an attack on top of that. So to make it a bit more clear, I brought two examples with me. So we stay in this scenario. And we take for these sequences, we make it super simple. We always use one instruction for the sequence. And all the sequences use the same instruction. So we use an increment on a memory address. So basically, we touch a memory address. And we use that for the reset sequence, for the trigger sequence, and for the measurement sequence. So if you look at the cold path, the reset sequence is an increment of a memory location. What happens there, it will be put into the cache. We access this data. It also gets dirty. It's a modified cache line. It's in the cache. The measurement sequence does the same thing. It increments a memory location that is already in the cache. So that will be fast. On the other side, with the trigger sequence, we also do the reset. The increment, as before, puts a modified state in the cache. Then we have the trigger sequence that also increments this memory location, which is in the cache. So that's fast, but we don't care about the timing here. So it stays in the cache. And then the measure sequence also increments this memory location, which is in the cache, which is also fast. So both cases show the same timing. So this is not a new side channel. That's, that's nothing interesting. And that makes sense. Some increments don't interfere with each other. But now let's replace the reset sequence with a flush. So we know this flush from the flush and reload attack before. It removes data from the entire cache hierarchy. So our reset sequence is now a flush of the memory address. And the other sequences stay the increment of this address. What happens now? In the cold path, we flush the memory address from the cache. And then this address is not cached. And when we increment that in the measurement sequence, that takes a long time because it has to be fetched from main memory. In the hot path, we also reset it. We flush it. It's not in the cache. When we execute the trigger sequence, it will be put into the cache. And in a measurement sequence, it's already in the cache. So when measuring it, it will be fast. And now we have timing differences. And now we know this is something interesting. And yes, it turns out this is basically flush and reload. So we have the flush. And then we measure by reloading the memory. In our case, it's an increment, but it's still a memory access. And if nothing happened by the victim in between, it's slow. But if the victim executed the trigger sequence, like another memory access, then it's fast and we can see that. So that all already rediscovers the flush and reload side channel in our nice sequence triple model. Now we can do that for all the applications. So we simply take an ISA description of a CPU, extract all the instructions there are, and then start generating triples for triggers, for reset sequences, and for measurement sequences. And then we execute random combinations of these instruction triples. And always see with the hot bath and the cold bath if we see timing differences. If you do, we still try to confirm that a bit, randomize that, execute that multiple times, because there could be some interference from, from somewhere else, could be rescheduling, some interrupts, some unrelated application. So we do that multiple times. And if you always see the timing difference, that's a good sign that we actually found some interference between instructions. In the end, we will have a lot of them. Just think about the flush and reload. The reset sequence is a flush. And trigger and measure is everything that accesses the memory, either a store or a load. So we'll find like hundreds of variants of flush and reload, where we always have the flush, and then something that accesses the memory. So we also cluster that a bit to make it easier to manually analyze in the end. So we look at, for example, performance counters to see which elements are involved in the CPU. We also look at the instruction itself and see which 
category of instruction it is, and then create some clusters. And this gives us in the end a report telling us what to look at, what could be interesting as a new source for a side channel. We did that on five different CPUs from AMD and from Intel. And we let that run around four days per CPU. And that already resulted in some nice discoveries. So we rediscovered two already known side channels, which is not that interesting, but it's still nice because it confirms that the approach works and also finds things that have been discovered manually before. But in addition to that, we also discovered four new side channels. They haven't been known before. And these are not some obscure side channels that are completely useless. No, we showed that we can also build attacks on top of that. So we also showed two new attacks. One of them is quite an interesting observation. It's about the hardware run random number generator that can be accessed using the RG rand instruction. And it turns out that this instruction has cross core interference. So if some CPU core uses currently RD rand to get random numbers, then the latency for other cores increases. And that works cross core and also cross VM. And it doesn't require any memory, no shared memory, nothing, just this instruction. And we showed that it actually works on the cloud as well. We tested that on the AWS cloud and we're able to stealthily transmit data between two VMs without using any documented uh, interface, without using the network, anything, just relying on this hardware instruction. And this channel is like not the first covert channel in the cloud, but has some really nice properties. It works on AMD and Intel CPUs, which is really fascinating. It works inside virtual machines, and of course, then also in native code. It's not that slow, so we managed to do one kilobit per second of transmission without optimizing that. It does not require any memory. So that's also something that is quite new. That also means current approaches can't detect that. There are no performance counters, nothing that could detect this kind of covert trans transmission. And there's also no mitigation. This instruction is always available. You can't disable it and you can't monitor it. You can't trap it. So this is something that cannot be prevented on current hardware, which makes it quite a powerful and interesting uh, side channel and cover channel. Another observation that we had that was also not known before that, we know flush and reload. We know that with CL flush, we can flush something from the cache. But we also figured out with Osiris with the fuzzing that the CL flush can be replaced by a non-temporal move. And a non-temporal move is a store instruction that also flushes things from the cache because it's a hint to the CPU that the cache is not needed for that data. And it turns out it flushes the data then if it's in the cache. And it's like, okay, you say like, that's not so interesting, but it turns out it also has some nice properties compared to CL flush. It is a bit faster. So we attribute that to the cache coherency protocol involved there. It's super stealthy. If somebody scans binaries for CL flush, because CL flush is mostly used for microarchitectural attacks, this application won't find that, super stealthy. And also new cache designs, they don't consider that, they consider flush, but who considers a non-temporal move? So that might also circumvent some mitigations put into new cache designs. So if also used that, it's also useful uh, for meltdown attacks. So previously, Meltdown attacks only leaked like up to three bytes at once for one illegal access. So you can do leak like 24 bits at once. And if you replace the seal flush with this MOF NT, then it's faster. And we were able to leak nearly eight bytes at once. You can leak 64 bit secrets most of the time at once, which is also a pretty nice improvement there, making these attacks even more powerful. And as mentioned in the beginning, we can also use that for a KSL outbreak to figure out where the kernel is stored in our virtual address space, which is uh, quite useful for traditional software exploits. And we came up with a setup like that. We tried the MOF NT on kernel addresses, 
see if something happens, if something interesting happens on the kernel as well. And it turned out moth NT on kernel addresses influences conflicts between flush and loads in user space. And so if you flush an address in user space and load it again, like doing a flush and reload attack, then the cache state of the load, whether it's a cache hit or a miss, depends on the kernel address that we dereference in between using the moth NT. So that also gives us information about the kernel. It tells us which kernel address is mapped or not mapped. So this is also a nice new attack that works on modern CPUs where all the other case LR breaks don't work anymore. So we see this bit of fasting for a few hours already resulted in quite some interesting things. It improved the implementation of transient execution attacks. But you might now say, like, can we also find them? Like, not only improve them, can we also find them? Turns out, spoiler, yes, we can. So for that, we focused on a subset of these attacks. We focused on the microarchitectural data sampling attacks that contain like zombie load, riddle, fallout, and meltdown uncacheable. And these are just like the base names. And all of them have different variants with different leakage targets and different ways to trigger them. So it's quite complex to reproduce all of them, also find all of them. There are probably many more out there, many more variants. But they all have something in common that we again can use for fuzzing. They all require a fault, like a page fault, or a microcode assist, which is kind of an internal fault in the CPU where it has to handle some really complex case. And so for all these MDS attacks, for all these microarchitectural data sampling attacks, they are on the high level quite similar and quite easy. You try to read from a memory location that leads to a fault. There you architecturally stop. Transiently in the out of order execution, you still get a value back and it is some value, typically something that's close by from a different buffer stale values, something that was used on the hyper thread. You transiently get this value in the out of order execution. Then you encode that in the microarchitecture, for example, by accessing a memory location that depends on the value you read. So if you get value K, we access page number K on, in some array. This will be cached. And then afterwards, if we resolve the fault, we go through this user memory, see which part is cached, and from that, See so here, for example, part k is cached. We infer that the value we got was a k. With that, we get actual data just by using this fault, encoding it in the microarchitecture, and using a side channel to recover it there. And it turns out, faulting, when we talk about faulting, most people think of, about page faults. But actually, there are many, many possibilities for faults on modern CPUs. So we tried to have like a a short sequence here on what could go wrong. And it turns out quite a lot of things can go wrong if we do a simple memory access. The CPU has to check whether the virtual address is in a correct form. It's canonical, if not, it faults. If yes, it has to check, is it in the TLB? Not in the TLB, it has to trigger page mishandler if it's not there, then check the permissions, then check if this page is actually present, if, if it can be accessed. If the page was not accessed before, it has to trigger some internal code to set the access bit. Then for a vector instruction, it has to check whether this memory access is actually aligned. Then it has to check, is it within one cache line or does it span, span over two cache lines? Is it cached or not cached? Was there a dependency on a previous store? And are we in a transaction that could abort? So there are quite a lot of points in a memory access where things can go wrong and throw an exception. And this graph is not complete. So will be many more cases as well. The idea is now to mutate existing variants, to trigger different faults here and see what happens. So in Transcinter, we used building blocks from Meltdown, from Riddle, from Fallout, from Zombie Load, and some other random instructions, and let this application mute data. So take parts from here, from here, add some instructions here, remove some instructions there, mutate it, and generate new potential meltdown code sequences. 
then we execute these code sequences and see if we get data out of that. If there's no leakage, well, that's in most cases, then we continue mutating, randomly mutating, building our weird code. But if we get some values out of that, then we send it to the classification step, where we again look at performance counters, seeing like which elements are involved, like, oh, there's a store buffer involved, this is active all the time, might be a variant of fallout, or maybe something new. And then give that classification again to an expert and check what this transcendent tool found. To also get a bit more information of what we actually leaked, we before fill all the microarchitectural buffers with known values. So we fill the cache with known values, store buffers, uh, fill buffers, and so on, so that if we leak them values, we know from where we leaked them. And we only let that run for 26 hours. And in that time, we already saw 100 unique leakage patterns, seven attacks that were reproduced that were not in the initial set for the fuzzer, one completely new vulnerability, and one regression. So this new vulnerability was then dubbed Medusa. It's a variant of zombie load that focuses on the right combining buffer, a buffer that is used for these fast string operations on Intel CPUs. They are, for example, used for memory copy in the OpenSSL crypto library or in the kernel. And we showed that we can directly leak then the strings that were copied using these instructions and with that leaked an RSA key from OpenSSL. So with a new nice attack without any unrelated values. We also discovered this regression in the Ice Lake microarchitecture. This microarchitecture reported no vulnerabilities, but Transinter still found a slightly mutated variant of fallout that again worked. So it was not completely fixed. Luckily, Intel was able to provide a microcode update there. So now it's again fixed. So that's the, the good news here. So we have seen from these examples that we have like these small specialized fuzzers. So far, we only covered small fields of possible vulnerabilities. The fuzzers are extremely simple and dumb with a narrow scope. They don't consider complex sequences. They don't have any guidance function like software fuzzers do. Yeah, super specialized. They're not the only specialized fuzzers. So we have more specialized CPU fuzzers. There's like SandSifter, finding undocumented x86 instruction, AppSynth, finding contention on the same core. Both authors of these fuzzers now work for Intel. There is fast spec that tries to find spectre variants with neural networks or crosstalk that tries to find cross-core transient execution attacks. And all of these fuzzers are quite simple and still they found a lot of things. Mostly low-hanging fruit, but still they find things. And if these simple fuzzers already find vulnerabilities and problems, yeah, well, then we can imagine that we need a bit of more research and then can find more complex things because now they are as sophisticated as software fuzzers in the year 1990. So this is really, really bad. But it showed that even these bad fuzzers are good enough to find things within hours on multiple CPUs from side channel to vulnerabilities. And my prediction, they will get smarter and then they will find a lot more vulnerabilities in our hardware. So if you want to play around with that, our fuzzers are open source. You find them on GitHub. They also have papers with them that explain the concepts. So check them out if you want to have some more information or write me an email. And with that, I can only say, yes, fuzz all the things and try to find some new vulnerabilities to make our systems in the end a lot more secure. And that's from my side. So thanks for your attention here. Thank you, Michael. It was amazing. Uh, and yes, fuzz all things, guys. Uh, time for questions. Friends, uh, if you have any questions, please send them across the Zoom chat. Uh, I will read them out uh, for Michael.
either Michael, you have fuzzed everybody's brains out or they are still confused what to question you. Yes. Uh, could you, okay, uh, could you share the uh, GitHub uh, link? Yes. Um, let me, sorry, I ended up too early here. Um, yes. That. I know it was, was quite some, a lot of content to, to compress that into 30 minutes, <laughs> but I hope that the, the papers are helpful and also the software. Some of the things can basically run out of the box and you will see quite some nice results then. So uh, I have a question in the meantime. Uh, Michael, you know, you've listed I think four fuzzers uh, which are used for CPU uh, fuzzing. Uh, I'm sure these open source tools have been also used by uh, OEMs uh, and hardware vendors, right? But still, we still, uh, they miss some bugs. What is the reason? Do you, do you think it's lack of knowledge or, you know, what is the reason it could be? So right now, so for these fuzzes, the problem is that they are quite simple and they, uh, they don't really have this, this guidance there. So in software fuzzes, we instrument the software and then the fuzzer sees like, okay, I've explored this part of the software, this part here, and it, it can optimize the, the input generation. For hardware, we don't really have that. So we are basically yeah, lo looking at, at the like box there and then trying to figure out what's going on there and, and just randomly generating code, hoping that we trigger something that we haven't seen before. Uh, so that makes it a lot slower. And there's also quite a complex interaction of all these elements involved. So we can consider a CPU as a super complex software project. Because True, I understand. Uh, uh, CPUs are written in, in hardware description languages. So it's also software. Yeah. And it makes sense that we have like the same bugs as when we write other software. Of course, they manifest itself in a different way. And easy bugs will be prevented with verification tools and a lot of testing during development already. But some complex bugs caused by interactions, as we see in CPUs, this is really hard to, to find them and, and search for them. And also fuzzing, yes, it, it takes a while. We also see that in software, Google is fuzzing Chrome 24 seven on I don't know how many machines on their entire cloud. And yes, they find bugs and, and still there are bugs left in the browsers. And there are all the time people find bugs with, with different approaches, smarter fuzzes. So yes, it's, it, it looks a bit like a cat and mouse game. So we improve the methods for finding vulnerabilities, then we fix all of them. The vendors use them, fix most of them, then researchers come up with new uh, variants for finding bugs. It looks like an, a never ending circle. It's actually more like a spiral. So we get more secure systems, we find more bugs, we get rid of the low hanging fruit. And yes, it, it just will take more years, more research to actually have that also in the entire process and, and find more bugs before we deploy uh, CPUs. And then hopefully they are more secure and it's not that easy to find such vulnerabilities again. Yeah, I guess we have to innovate our fuzzers. Okay, we have a question, uh, Michael, for you. Um, can you think of any incremental feedback for CPU fuzzers that is not leak, no, uh, and then I think he has a statement, maybe leveraging performance counters or something similar? Yes. Um, so this, uh, this is something that looks quite promising. Performance counters can already provide some sort of guidance. Maybe you see which elements of the CPU are involved when you execute codes, but it could also be more invasive. I can think of uh, like debug interfaces. Uh, if you have access to them, maybe because we are a vendor or work together with a vendor or so, uh, someone exploited like a CPU interface, we've also seen that, um, then this can also help to see better what is going on in the CPU, use these debug interfaces to get some kind of guidance. Also other side channel attacks could be used as guidance. So we can see like, is the cache currently active? Is the TLB active? So 
we can again then use side channel attacks or transient execution attacks to see what is going on in the CPU and use that as guidance. But this is all still open research. And yes, if you have ideas about that, feel free uh, to contact me. All right, thank you. Uh, Michael, there's one more question. Do you use any special list of instructions for the fuzzer? I mean, you mentioned stand sifter and mm -hmm. uh, stand, they provide a list of instructions. Is there any other way you find probably undocumented instructions and create a list of valid instructions? So uh, what we did is we only relied on documented instructions. So there's like an, an ISA description, for example, on UOPS info that contains all the instruction with all possible uh, parameters like uh, register, register, register memory, and so on. And we, rely, rely, we, sorry, we relied on such a list with all the documented instructions and only used them. Of course, undocumented instructions would also be super interesting. And as you mentioned, SendSifter, there are undocumented instructions. So it could also be interesting to add them to the fuzzer and see if they have some interference with documented instruction with each other or also allow some transient execution variants that rely on these undocumented instructions. But we have not done that. That's uh, interesting future work. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for the questions. Friends, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Michael, for sharing uh, this presentation with us. Once again, thank you, Michael. And let's fuzz all things. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for all the interesting questions you also asked them. Thanks. Have a nice day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.